I want to talk about two types of language. We'll call the first type objective or intellectual, and the second type subjective or emotional. And I have a story about what brought this concept home to me. I was in my 20s, I was sitting around with a few people, and on the TV there was a play. And it was a play set in the late 1800s, and there was a man in the play who would have been labeled a male chauvinist pig. This was in the 1970s, a lot of women were into feminism, and the man in the play, this is the late 1800s, said that women were the weaker sex and had to be protected, and he treated them as such. He'd open doors for them and show a lot of concern that, uh, that, that they weren't able to do things and he had to help them. And as we were watching this, there was a woman in the group whose name was Penny, and she was getting more and more angry at the man. It was almost amusing because it was like watching a thermometer or watching the, uh, the temperature go up. And finally, Penny blurted out, that hypocrite, that hypocrite. Coincidentally, about a week before that, one politician had called another a hypocrite or something, and I decided to look up the word, because I know it wasn't a compliment, but I, I just, I didn't quite know what it meant. Now, a hypocrite, according to the definition, is someone who says one thing but does the opposite. Suppose a man says, I hate coffee, I never drink coffee, but then secretly, when no one's looking, he drinks coffee. He's a hypocrite, because he's saying one thing but doing the other. But a man who says, I hate coffee and I never drink it, and never does drink it, is not a hypocrite. So this man was not a hypocrite, because he said women were a certain way, and he treated them that way. He really believed it. Whether he's right or wrong, you know, we won't get into that. Uh, I don't think women are the weaker sex, but anyway, he treated them the way he uh, said they were. So, kind of to get a laugh, kind of to tease a bit, I said in the most naive way possible, I said, Penny, that man's no hypocrite. And I told her the definition of a hypocrite, and I, and everybody was laughing, except Penny was a little bit even more peeved. And she looked at me and she said, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. And I didn't know what she meant. What she meant was, you see that man? Ugh. Barf. That's what she meant. So she was expressing an emotion, a subjective feeling, but she was expressing it in terms of objective language. Now, let's apply this to religion. I'm, I'm sitting in a Christian church, and imagine the preacher says the following. He says, no matter what sins you have done, no matter how evil you have been, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, even if it's on your deathbed, if you accept him as your Lord and Savior, the blood of Jesus will wash away your sins and you'll go to heaven. And that makes people feel good. Oh, boy, oh boy, look at the power of Jesus. No matter what sins you've done. And now let's suppose the preacher says, and Jesus is the way and truth and the life. No one goes with the Father, goes to the Father but by me. If you're not, if you don't accept Jesus, you go to hell. And maybe the, the, the people in the congregation feel good about that too, because they've accepted him. They feel good. Okay, I'm good with God. Two sentiments, two claims that are very emotionally attractive to some people. But if you put two and two together, let's imagine a Jewish man was in a concentration camp with his wife and children, and he saw his wife and children brutalized and then killed. He himself was brutalized. But suppose he never lost faith in God, his God, the, the Jewish God, the Yahweh. And let's suppose there was a guard there that was a sadistic, horrible person who did all sorts of horrible things. But supposedly, before that guard dies, he starts worrying about the afterlife and accepts Jesus, and supposedly he goes to heaven. But supposedly the Jewish man does not. Now, if, if you tell that to a person, you're just doing an elementary logical deduction from those two things. But they would tend to deny it. They would tend to make up some excuse why that can't happen. And yet it follows logically from those two principles. Entirely logically. And I think it's because those two principles are not really objective truths, even though they're assumed to be. They're just subjective, things that make you feel good. But don't think about them too hard. The Catholic Church taught for many centuries that if you weren't baptized, you couldn't get to heaven. And I read once, I believe this is true, that in Ireland, if a pregnant woman, if in, upon giving birth, if it seemed like she was having trouble and she and the baby would die, 
they would cut her open and remove the baby so the baby could be baptized. Or even if the baby looked like it was going to die and she was healthy. Because after all, she's been baptized, she's going to go to heaven. But the baby hasn't been. And this is an Irish village, no anesthesia, maybe just a little whiskey. Very savage, but that, I believe, is what happens when you mistake emotional language for intellectual language. And I see this all over religion. I'll just say one more thing. The story of the three magi around the time of uh, Jesus' birth. A star comes, they follow the star. They follow the star to where? To Jerusalem, where they lose it. So they go all around the city saying, where's the king going to be born? They're brought before Herod. They tell Herod about the birth of this great king. And then they leave, and the star reappears, takes them to Jesus. They leave their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But now Herod knows a great king is to be born, and eventually he kills, he has all the male children under two years old slaughtered. Now, the, 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 the image of the three wise men bringing their gifts is a very nice little feeling, you know, it shows how Jesus was such a great person that these three kings came. But they were minding their own business, the three magi, and the star comes and they follow it. The star leads them to Jerusalem. They tell the king, Herod, about the birth of another great king, which doesn't make them very wise. I mean, kings have killed their brothers and sisters and to, to maintain the throne. And then the star reappears, they go, they leave their gifts. And also, an angel warns Jesus, Mary, and Joseph to flee so that Jesus isn't killed in this great carnage of killing every male child under two years old. But the angel doesn't tell Herod, hey, don't kill the children. It's a story that it has a nice emotional appeal if you don't think about it too much. So I think that a lot of religion is really emotional language, masquerading as intellectual language. Maybe when we read that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, it really means he was a great person. At any rate, I wanted to discuss this distinction between emotional and intellectual language, between subjective and objective language, and I think I have. I think that's an idea that's worth thinking about. So thank you.